Please turn your Bibles to Philemon, the book of Philemon. <coughs> Verses 8 to 17. Philemon 8 to 17. Let me read as we begin this time of meditation on God's Word. Philemon verses, verse 8 through 17. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bones, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead, he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but about a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17 as the last, If thou count me therefore a partner, receive me as myself. As you might have noticed, we have entitled our study of God's Word today as be your preacher's reliable partner. And the word partner is taken from the very last verse we just read. Verse 17, which says, If thou count me, therefore a partner. A partner in the gospel work, of course. Then he says, Receive him, Onesimus, as myself. Partnership between pastors and the, their congregants is much needed to have an effective ministry. A team spirit, a strong cooperation expressed by the members of the church would make a faithful and zealous God a pastor to push forward to do all things, both great and small, which God's good will have purposed. Many a times I have seen pastors who lament of the lack of support they have in the work of the gospel. They have great ideas, but no support from the people. They try to pull the pastor backward. I thank God that's not the situation in our church. I have received your full support in the preaching of the gospel, in, in spreading the gospel in many different ways, for which I am very thankful. I'm glad you are partners with me in the Lord Jesus Christ and His work. Now we can still learn a great lot of things, how we should function together. Now of course, if a man in the leadership of the church is to enjoy the kind of relentless support from the people. He has to be a godly man. He must be a reliable pastor. He must be faithful. If he is unfaithful and having no zeal for the Lord, then people will, of course, naturally become suspicious and withdraw their support. As a godly preacher plunges forward in the work of the Lord, it is a wonderful thing for him to know that there is a congregation that can be counted on at any time.
for the needs of the ministry. And there is such great joy than in serving the Lord. Certainly I'm in no way suggesting that a pastor must be a people reliant person. Definitely not. When we talk about the need of a supporting group of members of the church, we are not denying the need of a pastor to remain as God reliant. It is dangerous for a man in the leadership of the church to be a people oriented person or people centered person or uh, always relying on people. He has to be God centered, God focused, fulfilling God's will more than people's desires. Nonetheless, it is important for you to remember this. Christ has commanded that any preacher who work in his name should be working in alliance with the church. A pastor cannot be a lone ranger. A preacher cannot be a lone ranger trying to do everything on his own. That's not the way Jesus worked out in his kingdom how the gospel ministry should be carried out. He said, we are members of the same body, Christ being the head. We work in mutual support. Pastor may have a leading, leading role in guiding the church and plunging into the ministry, but he cannot do it on his own without getting support of the people. And to get the support of the people, he must be sure what he does is of God. Not his own ideas that he pursued. So when the preacher makes it sure that he is following the Lord and the people comes in to say, oh, thank God for a leader or a preachers, in plural of course, uh, that God has given to us. And let's rally behind them. Let's support the Lord's work. Naturally, that church become a powerful force in extending the kingdom of Christ on earth. Pastor and his congregation must be interlocked and move together for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Paul's letter to Philemon gives us a wonderful scenario of a coalition between a pastor and his congregation. And we are going to look at it and learn some precious lessons for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. So, come with me, my dear friends. Let us eagerly and earnestly look at this table that he has prepared for our spiritual nurture in Philemon verses 8 to 17. Now, for, I'm going to divide our study into two major sections today so we can easily comprehend the things that are here. And to keep up with the theme, I would say, firstly, we look at the preacher's proper attitude, and then we will go to the congregation's proper attitude. Firstly, the preacher's proper attitude, particularly taken from verses 8 to 13. A preacher has much to learn from Apostle Paul's letter to Philemon. So I call all my collaborators in the ministry to listen to me. Not only those who listen to me over the internet, web radio, but also those who are here with me, all the full-time staff of our church. Now take note, first of all, that the proper attitude you and I should have in the leadership of the church is ministerial authority tempered with love. Ministerial authority tempered with love. Look at verse 8 onwards, please. Open your Bibles and pay attention to what the scripture says. Therefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Well, we need to consider the following verses as well. Let me, having read these two verses, 8 and 9, now 
explain this point that the ministerial authority that we have must be tempered with love. As an apostle, as a minister of the gospel, as a shepherd of God's flock, Paul possessed much ministerial authority to command the people to rally behind him for the gospel's sake. If a pastor cannot preach with authority, he is a pathetic person in the leadership. Of course, his authority is tied to the scripture. As long as a scripture... And of course, here Apostle Paul talks about it by saying, Therefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, now, did you take note of that phrase, much bold in Christ? And the word bold comes from the Greek word parasian. That's the first word he used, parasian, which means boldness in speech, even in intimidating circumstances. Apostle Paul used this word in the book of Hebrews, boldness in approaching the throne of grace. In the context of prayer, every Christian can come to God's throne without fear because Jesus died for us and has reconciled us with God. So when we call on God, we have no need to fear. We have that boldness, that assurance, that certainty. So every pastor who teaches the truth has no reason to fear. He shouldn't say, may I suggest to you, no need. He say, I say, because the Lord has said. I say on behalf of Christ. He has the right to say it. But he better make sure what he's going to say is what God wants him to say. But if he is saying what God has commanded him to say, especially in explaining the scriptures, he naturally represents God and therefore possesses the authority that God has given to him. And so Paul says, Though I might be much bold in Christ, to enjoin you. Now, that means to command. But again, take note, he's not just saying, I must have the confidence. In fact, he's... says much bold and that's in the Greek the word much comes from the word polus which means in abundance or many depending on the context of course here it means in great authority with great boldness I speak to you Philemon by the way this is not self-confidence. This is not self-esteem. Uh, this is not self-promotion. This is a preacher's confidence in Christ. That's why he said, boldness in Christ. It is not that, oh, I got a degree, or I got a master's degree, or I'm a doctor of theology that gives me that, you know, boldness to speak. No. He didn't say that. He said, in Christ, I have much boldness. It was Christ-given authority. You know, that's why it's so significant that those who come to the leadership of the church must have deep conviction that they are called by the Lord. 
If they do not have a confidence that they are called by Christ, they cannot speak in such authoritative fashion. And of course, if they are called by the Lord, they will display all the characteristics of those who are called by the Lord. They won't behave like the ungodly. They won't behave uh, the way the uh, world would think. They will follow the way of the Lord. They will obey God's will. And they will be a perfect example to follow after. And it will be people's joy to look at them, to listen to them, and to emulate them in life. Because they do represent Christ. They are called, they are molded, they are prepared, they are equipped by the Spirit of God, and they are placed in leadership, and they do show God's authority over us. How blessed it is to live under God's authority. Think about that. How wonderful it is to live under God's sovereignty, under His supervision, under His guidance. What great peril will come upon us if we don't have God to reign over us, if we don't have a voice to tell us what God wants us to know. What utter spiritual poverty has come upon us? It is the congregation's blessing to have a pastor or pastors or preachers. And we thank God for many we have in our midst. And we pray that these men will remain faithful. And let all the preachers who hear me, look, you are the channel for the people to come to know God closely and His truth. And you have, therefore, a certain authority. Unfortunately, people do abuse it, and I'm going to talk about it. But look, again, there's another important point you got to notice in the very first verse, verse 8. What you read there toward the end is this. To enjoin thee that which is convenient. You know, I have this boldness in Christ, in abundance, so that I might enjoin or command you that which is convenient. Now the word convenient there means fitting or proper. From the Greek word aneko. That's the Greek word he used. Conven convenient. That is fitting. Now it is fitting that a pastor tell the congregation with authority. Now that's why I don't like people who preach from the pulpit and say, I propose to you. What propose? You declare. You're not supposed to propose to the congregation. You know, you can't go up the pulpit and say, Brothers and sisters, may I propose to you that you commit no adultery. I propose to you we be preachers of the gospel. What propose? You preach! Thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not commit adultery, or go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That is proper. That is convenient. That belongs to every godly pastor. <coughs> it would have been appropriate for Paul to command Philemon to take back Onesimus, the slave of Philemon who ran away after stealing, stealing goods. Nonetheless, Paul does not, at this point of time, knowing the difficulties surrounding the situation, exercise his authority and say, do it, Philemon. No. Look at verse 9. His, his ministerial authority is tempered with love. So he says in verse 9, at for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. <laughs> this is almost like downgrading his ministerial authority to such of a plea of an old man about to die and in the prison. Uh, this talks about the magnanimity of this great preacher, Apostle Paul. He being an aged elder or preacher of God's word in the church has every right to tell Philemon, Philemon, 
You have benefited from my ministry all these years. Now for Christ's sake, I'm thrown into the jail. I may be sitting in the jail and I'm pretty old. I know I won't survive very long now. My time of departure is coming at hand. But let me tell you, as your spiritual father, do it. But he didn't say that, but he says it this way. For love's sake. You know, I don't have to sort of demand from you because you are a man who loves the Lord. You are a man, Philemon, loves the people of God. I have seen it. And you are a lovable person and also a loving person. So I rather cash on, as we say, on your love. I rather take advantage of the Christian love that exists between you and me. Because there is no need for me to force you to do anything. There is no need for me to keep on nagging at you because you, you are not that kind of person who would turn a deaf ear. You are not the kind of person who would you know, say, Pastor, shut up, I got other things to do. You are a man who would rise up because of your love for me. So I would rather think of you as my loving brother and for our love's sake, for love's sake, of course, that's God-given love. I rather beseech thee. Look at that. What a gracious attitude. Here he mingles command with entreaty. Beautiful, isn't it? I can command. It is my right to command you to do what I'm going to tell you. But again, though I said it because that's my right. I don't want to make you think that I'm enf enforcing this idea on you. But this is what our love for Christ and our mutual love and our mutual love for others would require of us. So think of the love of God that works in us, Philemon. And because of that, I beseech you. Oh, he mingles command and entreaty. And he uses gentle means of persuading meant to be used rather than severe methods. Now it's good for all the church leaders, pastors and preachers, elders and deacons to remember. We have certain authority attached to our positions. But we should never be bullies for Christ. There's no such thing. Bullies have no part in God's work. We, a man of God cannot strive. A man of God cannot be discourteous, rude in his speech. When we have to persuade someone in our spiritual capacity as a leader of the church, we must use gentle persuasions. And Apostle Paul here does just that. And he says, such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know me, Philemon, you know me. What I suffer as a prisoner is because of Christ. All that I want is Christ. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I would require anything at all from you, it would be for Christ's sake. You know it. You love your Lord Jesus Christ. And I love him too. We both love Christ. And for that purpose, I am now in prison. Now you are free. So let's love the Lord in our own special circumstances. Now there are things that I want to do out of love for Christ. I can't do that but because I'm limited. I'm confined in my jail. But you, being free man, and having the same love that I have for Christ, you can do a lot of things that I can't do. Now I'm going to count you in for that work. Please do it for me. Do it for me, he says. And he is saying this as a gentle persuasion. You see, again I want to tell you this. This is very important. And all of you who have a desire to serve the Lord, I have noticed some brethren who have great desire to serve God, but they have ruled themselves out because they are sometimes a bit tough and rough. And they don't have the gentle way of persuading. They would like to come and say, Hey! I'm a Sunday school teacher. Do this! <laughs> oh, I am an usher. Do this! Oh, I am in charge of refreshment. Do this! 
And then everybody shy away, oh boy. And then you want to serve God. Actually, you have a real desire to serve God, but you know, you get too excited, you get things all weighed upon your shoulder, and you say, hmm, you better come and help me. You know, and then everybody run away. And uh, you become rather a pain in the neck than a real help that can be counted on. So I want you to consider this, okay? If, you have a, if at any time uh, you have been uh, too excited and then being pressurized by the burden and responsibility of the work become a little more demanding that you ought to be, now repent. This is a way to get things right. Paul is a classic example of that. Okay, you are not a leader to exercise your authority and finish off of the rest. You are a leader so that you can call the rest, bring them along, and then join in the service of God. And that's something we got to learn and we have to keep in mind. Paul had the power to command, yet he chose to beseech or plead. How beautifully he said. Let me show this. This is not the first time Paul did that. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5, please. And look at verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. What do we have? The scripture says, we beseech you. This is Paul's letter to the brethren in Thessalonica. And he says, if we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. And these are the full-time workers, the preachers of the gospel. So he tells the brethren in Thessalonica, Know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord. So, you know, the members are encouraged by Paul to get close to the leaders who rule, rule over them. Don't keep a distance from them. Go and be partners. That's what he's basically saying. And then verse 13. He says, To esteem them very highly in love. For their work's sakes, you see? You must esteem them in love, not in fear that separates us from one another, but in love. Why should you esteem them in love? Because they work for Christ, for their work's sake. They are preaching the gospel. They are extending the kingdom of God. They have a great burden. They are so often opposed by Satan and the world and the unbelieving people and disobedient Christians. So dear friends, don't be in the gang that oppose the preachers of the gospel. Don't be in the gang that make it difficult for the Lord's servants. If God has appointed them to rule over you, if God has appointed them to bear the burdens of counseling and preaching and caring for the people, now, for love's sake, get close to them. Esteem them. Join them. And be at peace among yourselves. So what a wonderful command to us. So both the preachers and the congregation must remember, especially the preachers, Whatever ministerial authority that we have is not to be used for personal advantage or self-glory or self-promotion. Whatever ministry authority that we have has to be always tempered with love and then persuade people to serve God. Of course, ministerial authority gives you the right to rebuke a person who unrepentantly follow sin. You can firmly tell him, and at times probably you have to raise your voice to tell him, no, you cannot do that. But even behind that rebuke, what you should have must be love. And when you raise your voice and say you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't say that, immediately you should <coughs> put on the garment of love to stoop down and wash his feet. And don't after rebuking, Give this attitude. <laughs> this fellow. Then go to another person. That lady. <laughs> Don't know why they come to church. The holy people like me should come to church. <laughs> Don't do that. That would be weird. And you should be praying for that brother whom you rebuked. Or the sister you rebuked. Love must temper our behavior in places of authority. Otherwise, we will become bullies, not ministers of Christ.
I can't help but to just read out some of the things I put it in, which is a reminder to myself, and I want to share it very quickly with all the brethren who serve in responsible places in this church. Remember this, ministers must deal in the mildest and gentlest manner that they may be if that they may able to entreat, persuade, exhort, beseech, even when they have to command. This should be the case. Sometimes we are to set aside our rights, such as, you know, Paul did just now, have the right to command you, and that I would love to plead with you. And that is something that we must not forget. We should not be unwise. We should not exhibit unwise audacity in the ministry. There are some people who are so bold, you know, they are so tenacious and they are rough and rugged and they bulldoze their way through. And it's so, so horrible to watch it. It is painful to watch it. We shouldn't be so unwise. We must be gracious. We must be polite. We must show the Spirit of Christ. There is a place for firmness. There is a place for boldness. There's a place for admonition and rebuke. But overall, it all must be tempered with love. Remember this. Love is more effective than severity especially in the preaching of the gospel and gathering people to cooperate with you. Love is more effective than severity when it comes to exhorting brethren unto good works. So if you want the team of people in your committee or in your particular group to serve with you, the way to exhort is what? <coughs> Loving gentle persuasion. Not root severe ways. Gentle courtesy of the gospel must be put on every time when we are out to serve God. Now there is another important attitude that we can learn from Paul in the ministry, especially in the leadership. That is commendation of fellow brethren. Authority tempered with gentleness, now commendation of fellow brethren. And you can see that from verses 11 to 13. Now let me just remind you as I read that. Verse 12. Now, sorry, I should read from verse, uh, a little earlier, verse 11 rather. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable. He's referring to um, Onesimus. Onesimus was unprofitable. In fact, he ran away instead of helping Philemon. And, but now profitable to thee and to me. And then he goes on to say, Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I have retained with me, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. You know, here... You see, great commendation given by Paul concerning Onesimus. What makes us so happy to recommend our brothers to others? A few things. Number one, we appreciate what the Lord does in a person's life. If I see a wicked man changing and he surrenders to Christ and the power of the gospel and he start to show great repentance and he start to, he start to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, then if I'm thankful to what the Lord has been doing, then I should encourage him I shall recommend him to others. We know Paul himself has experienced this in his life. He was a persecutor of the church, right? Apostle Paul, before his conversion, he was a persecutor of the church. You remember, 
when the Lord told Ananias to go and pray for uh, Saul so his blindness would go away. Ananias said, Lord, this guy has come to Damascus with authority to persecute us. How can I go and pray? The Lord said, you go. Ananias went and prayed. And then after that, the man whom God used to bring a, a soul who became Apostle Paul into the ministry was a gentleman called Barnabas. Barnabas was instrumental in incorporating Paul into the ministry. And now Paul likewise exhibit acceptance and promotion of a brother who is recently born into the kingdom of God. He mentions in verse 10 that I have begotten Onesimus in my bones. In the jail, somehow, Paul had an opportunity to meet with Onesimus. Onesimus was there for the crime he did. Paul was there for the gospel's sake. But Paul said, well, God brought this criminal to my cell so I can preach the gospel to him. He took the opportunity and preached the gospel and Onesimus became a convert. And he was so thankful for what the Lord has done. Every minister of the gospel must have this generous conduct of the apostle. Even to plead for a fugitive like Onesimus when they turn to Christ. That's why we have a wonderful ministry called the Gethsemane Care Ministry. It's a deep desire that the Lord put in our heart. That when the gospel and the power of God in the gospel changes a criminal, a drug addict, a gang member, a violent thief, a robber who has been imprisoned and could not be changed by the prison officers, come under the preaching of the gospel in our care ministry, changes. We accept them. We accept them. Get some in a BP church did just that. And therefore, we had Brother Paul Ching being appointed as the deacon of this church. We supported his ministry. And now he is shining for Christ as a minister of the gospel in Bethel, Melbourne. We have many more here. Isn't it? Think about preacher Daniel Lim who just finished preaching, I think, outside. I hear them singing, so I think he finished preaching. Now he was a former drug addict. He was a criminal in that sense. But look at him. Don't we love him? Shouldn't we accept him? Shouldn't we promote him? Look at Brother Jeremiah. Look at Brother Kelvin Lim. They're all full-time workers. Think about the past. Fugitives running to escape the, the police. There are some now in our midst. Oh, they have been so horrendously tormented by their own addictions. How we love them in the Lord. But if they change, of course they must change. They must convert by believing in the, Christ, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will promote them. You know, in, in the society we have a thing called Yellow Ribbon Project. Have you came across this? It's a big thing and under MCYS, Ministry of Community of youth and sports. And they undertake this so that, you know, the formal prisoners or ex-prisoners can be integrated into the society. And even then there is so much outcry among such people that society is very slow in integrating them. And I say this to you, my dear friend. If there is any society that can well integrate the ex-prisoners, it is the church. We call them to pray. We call them to worship with us. We call them to eat with us. We call them to join in our fellowship groups. We, join, we welcome them to go with us to retreats and camps. We put them in the same kind of rooms that we stay. They are like brothers to us. They love us. We love them. When the Spirit of God uses them with gifts, we acknowledge them. We put them as our leaders. We put them as preachers. This is the right thing to do. Praise God, the Lord is working in our midst. <clears throat> the glorious gospel. 
And we commend our fellow brethren. Ah, how thankful I was when Reverend Stephen Koo of Bethel BP Church asked me, is there a preacher that you can send? I said, of course, there are many. I recommend Brother Paul because he's free at this period of time. Use it. And he went there for, I think, about a week, I'm uh, sorry, a month or so. The people there, were, they fell in love with him. Literally. And they tried to tell him, tell Pastor Koshi I send you here. He got a lot of preachers there. Boy. <laughs> Even if we have 100 preachers, we still don't have enough. There's so much gospel opportunities to make use of them. And when, he, when Paul came back, I asked Paul Cheng, Paul, so what do you think? What did they say? Before he came here, I already got news. They want him there. So I kept quiet and asked him, what do you think? What did they say? A pastor, they want me to go back. Okay, but what do you, you think? You think God has burdened you to go? He said, I'm praying. After some time, he came back and said, Pastor, I think they need someone to help. May I go? I said, I am nobody to say you, you cannot go. If you're absolutely sure God has called you, you go. I will support you. And it was my pleasure to go there and lay my hands with other ministers of the gospel to ordain him as a pastor of Bethel BP Church. How wonderful. This is not to glorify me or our church, but to just to tell you what a joy it is to be a preacher of the gospel. Because we are given an opportunity that nobody can. It is far better than a prison officer. It is far better than a judge who condemns a criminal and sends them to gallows. It is far better to preach the gospel and bring criminals to Christ and make them useful people. Oh, what a glorious gospel. What a glorious work. I would love to be a preacher at all times. Anytime. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I preach the gospel because it is power unto salvation to those who believe, first Jews and then the Greeks. So dear friends, let's comment one another. And especially the preachers, you must know, you are not in a place so you can secure the place for yourself and not anybody else can come. Yes, you have the place. But at the same time, you lift others also. And sometimes in lifting, you may lift somebody even above you as God directs. And they become even more useful in the Lord's work. If that's the case, let it be. But we must be always commending people generously. And this is really the way Jesus works in the church. What Jesus does is, he saves me, a wretched sinner. He be becomes very patient with me. He graciously walks with me. He talks with me. He empowers me by his spirit. And then he places me a place that I have never dreamt of. I never ne dreamt to be in Singapore. I never dreamt to be a preacher in this church. I never dreamt to be having all these opportunities to extend God's kingdom. These are all God given. My Lord gave it to me. If he has been so generous, should I not be generous also? Should I not also lift up somebody else? If every preacher, every elder, every deacon in our midst have that spirit of commending one another. Let me tell you, the devil has to stand by the side and watch Christ is going to do through us. There will be more salvation, there will be more edification, there will be more fruit bearing for Christ. Is it not what we desire? And we should. Now quickly, the proper attitude of the members of the church. Are you ready? Let's go quick. Stay with me, please. Okay, now we will look at verse 14 to verse 17. Verses 14 to 17. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Now here, what a member of church should have is willingness. Voluntarism, in other words. Paul says, you know, 
I can command you to do this and that, but I don't want to do, but rather I have you willingly respond to this piece of information I'm giving you. The piece of information is, you are criminals, you are an unprofitable slave who ran away from you. You paid for him, you purchased him, you looked after him, you gave him duty to do, you, you have been a kind master, Philemon, you have been very good to him, but this guy cheated you, ran away and get caught, put in the prison. Now he has been unprofitable in that way, but I want to tell you he has changed. He became profitable. I have that experience. He had been kind to me. He looked after me in the jail. In fact, if you were to look into verse 13, just back up a bit and see this. He says in verse 13, Whom, referring to Onesimus, I would have retained with me, I would have retained Onesimus, that in thy stead, in, in other words, in Philemon's stead, Philemon loved Paul, so he says, Onesimus actually would have worked in your stead. He might have ministered unto me in the bones of the gospel. He said, you know, actually I have another thing in my mind. You know, he goes something like this. This is what he's saying. Philemon, you know, you love me, isn't it? Onesimus also loves me now. Now, actually Onesimus is your slave. Though he ran away, you still have the ownership over him. You are, you are the rightful owner of Philemon, I mean Onesimus. So Philemon, maybe you know, see I can do this. Because you love me, I know you love to take care of me, but we are separated by distance. You are in Colossae, I am in Rome, in the prison. Now anyway, your slave is with me, so you don't mind because you love me, that your slave serve me. And I can take advantage of it, but I don't want to be a selfish man. I rather give you back Onesimus. I could have had this line of argument. Hey, Philemon, what a tragedy. You couldn't change this, this slave of yours. You couldn't convert him. You couldn't make him profitable. He was unprofitable when he was with you. Now look, who changed him? It's me, Paul. Now anyway, you owe me. And now I change him. So is it not my right to just keep him? Because it's because of me he changed. Paul doesn't say that. Rather, Paul says, you know, my brother... I know you would willingly leave him with me, but I don't want to take advantage of it. You better take back Onesimus, so that he might benefit you. But to do that, Paul says, I want you to be willing. You know, my dear friends, even to benefit from a God-given opportunity, one thing you need to be that is, you must be willing to, God's, willing to do God's will. God may put you in a very helpful, beneficial, spiritually and physically useful circumstance. But if you are an unwilling participant of that opportunity, the blessing will not be yours. You can't be a lazy person sitting there, God wants to bless me, bless me. I'm not interested in anybody. I want to come to church, okay. Uh, I like the corner, you know. I hope nobody will take my chair. I like that particular corner. I'm going to sit there. Well, I can sing, no problem. But don't ask me to do anything. I tell you, you will never even smell what blessing is. Because you are a lazy person. Every blessing is a responsibility. And every responsibility requires willingness. And if you are not going to be willing, no blessing. Philemon, you want Onesimus who is converted by the power of the gospel. You want the blessing of having a faithful brother by your side, in your home, in your church. Then be willing. How many of you are willing to be used by the Lord? How many of you are willing to say, Pastor, Elder, dear preacher, anytime, if you need help, let me know. I will do my very best. Of course, there are a lot of people who say that, but when time comes, they've got no time. They have no willingness. They will say, why always me? Why can't be others? Why me all the time? Yo, if it is you all the time, praise God, your blessings are going to be all the time. But that's not the way people behave. People will say, ah, oh, ah, push, 
that so many other people they can do and sometimes they come up with good line of argument you know what I'm not so good uh. I think I, I'm not so good a uh. pastor somebody else would do a better job Philemon could have said hey Apostle Paul it's very nice to you to think this way but let me tell you uh, I have no patience for this kind of people I don't want to see his face Onesimus didn't get lost I don't care whether he gets rot in the prison, but don't send him back to me. He has stolen my money. Now that's not what Paul did. That's not what Philemon did. Philemon responded to it, and Paul wanted him to be responding. So be a willing Christian. And read next verse, verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Now this is a confidence in God's providential working. You not only must be a willing partner in the, in the gospel, but also one who have confidence in God's providential working. You know, there are many things that you are called to do which are burdensome sometimes. You may have fear. You know, if I only men were to say, Oh, Paul, you know, it's so hard to trust this guy. <clears throat> he has cheated me, you know. I've been very generous. I've been very generous, I've been very kind, I was not like other masters, I'm a Christian. And you know me, Paul, you said that I've been refreshing the bowels of the saints, I've been kind and I've been taking care of them. And I did the same thing, thing to this man. But he is a cheat. I can't see how God will work. I have no confidence. I don't want to be part of it. You could have said that. But here Paul persuades him, says, perhaps this whole thing happened so that he may be now a while be away from you, but then be joined back to you that he may be your partner in life and ministry. It's really amazing. You know, Paul has displayed this, this many times. He was very unhappy with John Mark one time. And he argued with Barnabas and said, Barnabas, we can't take John Mark because he has departed from the ministry. He has gone away. I don't want to take him. And the argument between Paul and Barnabas was so severe that Paul and Barnabas separated at that time to preach the gospel in different places. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took, Paul took others and left. After some time, Paul realized John Mark repented. And start to serve the Lord faithfully. You know what was Paul's response to it? He called John Mark, my beloved son. And sometimes there are situations that would happen where we have to take a stand. But when others commend certain brothers to us with recommendations that they have changed, they love the Lord, our heart must be wide open like a door that flings open when somebody wants to welcome us you know that's the kind of spirit we need to have and I, I want to tell you there are brothers who backslided isn't it there are those who have utterly disappointed us in the ministry and we don't understand why such things happened and we can't even think of them becoming a useful person again in the ministry but we must, li we must think this line of argument that Paul puts forward Perhaps he's saying that I can't think of any other way. If you have never thought about it, let me introduce this to you. That God has allowed this, that he may be yours forever. Ah, oh, what a beautiful way to encourage Christians to accept one another. So there was a confidence that Paul re required of Philemon. In the providential leading of God. Now next verse. Verse 16. Not now as a servant. But about a servant. A brother beloved. Specially to me. But how much more unto thee. Both in the flesh and in the Lord. He says have a brotherly spirit. Have a brotherly spirit. And that's the third quality a church should have. You must always display brotherliness. We are not in a competition in the church. We are not racing against one another. We are not here to show who is a better preacher. 
And I shouldn't be preaching to show that I'm a better preacher than Dennis Kabingi or preacher Daniel Lim or, uh, you know, all other preachers that we have here. I shouldn't be uh, an elder if I am to show that, oh, look, I'm better than Elder Martin Kuang, I'm better than Alan Choi, I'm the elder. <laughs> this is not the reason why we are serving. Well, one may have more gifts than the other, one may be more useful than other, as God would plan it to be. Nonetheless, nobody should think, oh, I should suppress others so that my name will be high up. That would be very disastrous. It shouldn't be the reason. Then you will never prosper. And especially in the congregation. You my dear brethren. And I say this with a tinge of pain. As well as a tinge of happiness. Happiness because. I have seen some of you really. Go extra mile to care. Even those who have offended. But I know also of some of you. Just because somebody accidentally stepped on you or said a word that is not so pleasant to hear, that's it. The whole ear, no more talk. Avoid the brother. I know her. I know him. I'm not going to talk. No, that's not what Paul recommends. Paul says to Philemon, he was a servant, we understand. He will continue to be a servant. But about a servant, a brother beloved, uh, you can't talk about brotherliness without love. It's Philadelphia. Loving the brothers. And you must be able to call one another beloved brother. You know, it's quite difficult to say brother, and it's more difficult to say beloved brother, right? Now, I think it's Sunday morning when we see one another, I brother Francis, or brother Chip Hung, or brother Jeremy, or something like that. But to say, I'm my beloved brother. Oh. Uh, should I? Uh, that's a bit too much, isn't it? No need to be so lovey-dovey. <laughs> that's how sometimes we think. No need to be so affectionate. Now keep a distance. Brother, okay? Okay. Take care, brother. So we sort of keep that at a limit and we don't want to go any further. No. Well, I understand sometimes brotherliness is limited by our sins, the offenses that we make. I understand the pain and the struggle. I must have go through it. Nonetheless, we must pray for the Spirit to love one another with unfeigned, sincere love, as the scripture exhorts us. Finally, we are on verse 17. If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If your pastor in the preaching of the gospel win a soul who have offended you in the past, recommends this soul to you, how will you respond? With hatred? If you are going to be a real partner, you got to come in and say, Welcome, brother. Welcome, brother. Let me ask you, are your elders, are your preachers in a situation they can recommend to you out of love the work of the gospel? <coughs> Will I be able to pick up the phone one day and say, Brother, that missionary is coming by. I need a room. We, you know, I probably, you know, I, I have two people in my house and extra people, visitors. So can you have this brother? Will you open your house? Uh, somebody else, okay? Can or not, Pastor? Church got so much money. Huh? They're in the whole hotel room. Lah. You know, go and get a hotel. Don't trouble us. I tell you something about Singaporeans. We are less tolerant than ever before. We are unwilling, most of us, unwilling to share our comfort with others. And I have been here for long, I mean, enough years to know this. Hospitality is one of the last things 
Many, not all Singaporeans, there are many wonderful Singaporeans who are hospitable. I praise God for them. But general trend, don't step into my space. It's mine. My property. My house. My money. You know, sometimes I wish all of us had the charity where our preachers come by from overseas. You quickly open. The moment you hear the announcement, oh, you know, I can tell you from my own experience, it is sometimes wonderful to give up my family bed for a visiting missionary couple. If there's a joy in sleeping on the floor when a gospel worker and his wife and children stay in my bedroom with comfort that night. And from the floor, I can praise God. If Jesus would leave heaven's glory to stoop down to wash our feet and to bear our sins and die on the cross, why would we reject the same love? Should we not receive it and let it shine? You know, the more we flourish in the gospel work, more charity is required of us. More acceptance and hospitality is required of us. Okay? So young couples, I see some, are going to get married. Learn, huh? your house is not for yourself. You pray, pray, ask the church people, Lord, please pray that I will get a HDB flat soon. Yeah, thank God I got a HDB flat. Now nobody can come in. <laughs> not even Jesus, right? Not even angels. If you are not hospital, you are not going to treat an angel, all right? The Bible says. <coughs> you want more blessings? Open your heart to receive God's people. And of course, I understand in certain circumstances, if your relatives are non-Christians, they may not appreciate a Christian coming into your house. Then of course, you can be generous. You can be kind to them. Maybe you rent a room for them in a hotel. But I really don't like that. I like our preachers to stay with us as much as possible. Now, I'm not talking about long terms, but in this case, by the way, it's going to be a lifelong acceptance. <coughs> Philemon now had to stand up and say, I will be the kind of Christian master that you can ever have. I will be the best. I will be willing. I will trust in God's providence. I will count you as my brother. Come into my house. This is what Paul expects. Can I, can I as your pastor, expect that from you? Because of love, I can't demand it from you, I know, but I can beseech you, can plead, I believe so. If we love the Lord Jesus together, we must do that. Let us pray.